Um, yeah, so let me introduce myself first. So my name is Tanvir Gill, and I am CTO at a startup called Flux Ninja. And today I'll be talking with you guys about observability-driven load management, which is a set of techniques which are used by operators to ensure fault tolerance and reliability of the services. So let's get started. Let's, so let's start off by talking about the base capabilities that you get in Istio today. So the capabilities of Istio are centered around three pillars. Uh, the first one being security, so basic encryption between services, mutual DNS between services, and also some basic access control. So use cases such as micro segmentation, making sure that uh, services are talking to each other intentfully. Uh, the second pillar uh, is centered around traffic management. So these are some basic network settings like timeouts, retries, load balancing algorithms, and also things like uh, passive checks, um, like outlier detections and circuit breaking, and also some CI CD oriented kind of features like canary deploys, AB tests, and so on. The third bucket is observability. So given that Istio is kind of at this interesting vantage point where it's witnessing all this service to service chatter. So it's able to give unprecedented visibility into this chatter and that too without modifying your. So even despite these great base capabilities, like once you go and take your and take any application into production, there, there's still um, a dearth of features around flow control. So what I mean by that is like, Whenever you take your apps into production, you need basic rate limiting when basically at the gateway, you want to make sure that if you have a shared service or, or a multi-tenant service, which is shared amongst various entities or users, you want to make sure that uh, there is fair access between the users. And also there are, it, it isn't the case that a subset of users are monopolizing the majority of resources. So you need some kind of basic protection in that layer. Another thing is like, um, your capacity of your services is is finite, right? And and it, because it's it's expensive to provision like or over provision services. So um, another thing you want to make sure is that if your services are getting overloaded, uh, it should not lead to cascading failures. And uh, the good throughput essentially of your service should remain high despite any kind of overloads coming into picture. And um, so so the next thing is like when you're working with. Because whenever you're developing an app, like uh, you're always dependent on some third-party systems or some open-source APIs or even some uh, managed services like DynamoDB or if you're using it, if, if it's an AI app, you're dependent on OpenAI, for instance. So you want to work backwards from those limits. And first of all, you want to make sure you're a good citizen. You stay within those limits because otherwise, those third-party APIs might even penalize you. For instance, GitHub penalizes you if you go over limit too often. right? So you want to make sure you stay within those limits. And also you want to make sure for uh, both these use cases, both for protection as well as when it's working with external limits, you want to make sure um, that you're using those quotas or those limits effectively. Like you, like any app will have its own um, set of priorities or based on the business use case, like certain, or not all requests are equal, right? Certain requests are more important. So you need some kind of scheduling when you're close to these limits. You want to make sure that high, uh, high importance requests are given a, um, a better chance of getting accepted. So yeah, so flow control is a must when you're running at scale, even even at moderate scale, to be honest, right? So you need uh, API rate limits to ensure fairness and prevent abuse. You need adaptive limits per service to prevent overload. So, so but what I mean by that is um, based on where the bottlenecks are in your app, in your app typically they are uh, in the most um, heaviest kind of APIs or data intensive portions of your workload, uh, typically databases or big data systems. So those usually become a bottleneck. So you want to make sure you, that you get the saturation signal or the queue signal from those systems and use that to basically do throttling. And do, do throttling as downstream as possible, detect the problem upstream and block it as soon as possible to reduce wasted work. And again, you need prioritization. So once you start throttling, then you want to make sure that the most important requests get uh, at the head of the queue. And the third one is like what we talked about, like when working with third-party APIs, uh, you want to eliminate the guesswork essentially. Like let's say you're hitting a API rate limit with OpenAI and you get a 429, then what do you do? When do you retry? Especially when it's shared quotas, right? You're using the same key across a lot of uh, distributed workloads. Then how do you eliminate that guesswork and basically, uh, go as fast as possible while also prioritizing the requests. 
So uh, keeping that in mind, I'm going to introduce this open source project called Aperture and how it can help do flow control in Istio Service Mesh and even other environments. So here's a quick overview of the Aperture project. So it's an open source uh, observability driven flow control system. It has got a programmable uh, declarative policy language which lets you express um, basically these um, uh, flow control policies as control circuit graphs. These are like signal processing graphs. Um, and it's an observability driven system. Essentially, it's completing the feedback loop, taking observability signals from your infrastructure and using that to do flow control. And interestingly, it works on top of your existing stack. So if you're using service meshes such as STO, so it's just a drop-in replacement, it's just not a replacement, like a drop-in uh, augmented functionality that you get on top of STO. Or even if you're using API gateways like Nginx and Kong, we have like Lua plugins into those um, projects. And if you're using none of those, if you're, if you're just plainly using like simple um, HTTP servers, then we have SDKs which can either do middleware insertion or you can pretty much write code to do this kind of uh, flow control functionality with, within your application logic itself. So that's a brief introduction. Now let's delve in a little bit deeper. So what does this aperture bring to STO? So it basically bring, brings in these observability driven flow control capabilities. So there's a Rago based uh, request classification layer, which um, lets you um, basically look at labels in your traffic and have criteria for driving new labels or even going deep into your payload, for instance, going deep into your GraphQL APIs and extracting labels from those. And now these labels, interestingly, can be used for both visibility as well as control. It provides a distributed rate limiting implementation. So think of it as think of it as like uh, um, STO's rate limiting service. Although we are not using rate limiting service, we are using Auth API, but it's kind of giving you this rate limiting capability. So you can um, uh, do rate limit users in a distributed fashion and in a very scalable way. Uh, the second capability is adaptive limits and request prioritization. So this this capability. Um, builds upon that, uh, that, that circuit-based uh, policy implementation, essentially letting you to take any signal from your infrastructure, which is basically measuring the bottleneck. It could be a queue size, it could be thread counts, it could be latencies, any signal which indicates uh, in a reliable way overload buildup in your system. So that signal can be used to adaptively limit uh, your APIs, API calls essentially closer to the, uh, to the entry point. So that's the adaptive limits feature. And the, and the third one is quota limits. So essentially um, working with third party APIs or even within teams, you might have quotas. Like you, you might have, um, some team might have given, um, like microservices teams, they uh, uh, give each other quotas like uh, so, that they, so that one team doesn't overwhelm uh, one particular service. So it could be either between services within a larger organization, or it could be some third party like DynamoDB or OpenAI or GitHub. So you want to work with those limits. And again, ensure prioritization of requests. So you want to make sure you use that quota in a prioritized fashion. And the last one is like telemetry. Uh, you get some telemetry with STU as well, but uh, this the telemetry that you can get with Aperture is even more surgical, like because it's tied to the Rago-based classification rules. So you can actually even go deep into your payload to get fine-grained matrix and even get like latency histograms. Um, so if, if you want to get like percentile kind of matrix, so it's, it's, it's geared towards those kind of use cases. So next, let's look at how uh, Istio plus Aperture, the entire stack works together. So Aperture agent sits next to the on -wire proxy. So it's like a sidecar to the sidecar. And essentially the way it integrates is through authorization API. I talked about it earlier. Uh, and we're going to look at it in more detail in the next slide. Essentially, a couple of integration points. One is the Auth API, which lets us intercept calls coming into Envoy. So uh, Aperture can be installed at various vantage points um, that where Envoy proxy or Istio proxy is also installed. So at the ingress, the Aperture agent can help you achieve things like rate limits. So any call that goes into Envoy, so it, it gets forwarded to Aperture agent and it lets you implement things like rate limits. Like within services, it lets you build functionality such as adaptive limits. So again, the same insertion modes running next to your Envoy. And um, in this example, we are looking at a database. So a typical bottleneck uh, in, a, in, a, in a distributed app is usually a big data system or a database. So taking saturation signals from uh, these bottleneck services 
and using that to adaptively um, limit traffic going into your service, and then also prioritizing that traffic. And now the, uh, there's another use case of Aperture and Istio Service Mesh is on the end egress, like calls going outside your cluster to some third party. Uh, for instance, this could be like OpenAI, and you want to work backwards from that limit. You know, you want to model that limit internally using token buckets, and you want to limit. You want to you want to be a good citizen. You want to stay within limits, and once you're close to the limits, you want to prioritize traffic. So you want to use that OpenAI quota in an in, in an intelligent fashion so that uh, high priority requests get to use it first. So yeah, so these are the new set of capabilities we are adding on top of your existing Istio service mesh. So let's look at the insertion in a little bit more detail. So this is the Envoy um, side, the Envoy proxy, uh, the Istio proxy. So it gets requests from outside. That's step one. And the way Auth API works is, so by the way, this is Auth Z API, which was implemented by the OPA team for authorization kind of use cases. Uh, but for Aperture, we are using the same technique, the same glue for flow control. So the way it works is anytime a request comes in, uh, the Envoy proxy forwards it to Aperture agent for a yes or no answer, either to admit it or to drop it. And plus also we attach some metadata for telemetry purposes. So uh, if it's a no, then Envoy proxy won't really forward the request to the service. It will just send the response back with a 503 server BZ and, and the response can actually be configured through the aperture agent, the policy in aperture agent. But by default, it's like a 503 or if it's a rate limit, it could be a 403. And uh, the second point of integration is the access log. So this is needed for telemetry, um, a bunch of telemetry that we're doing, like looking at things like latencies, even estimating tokens dynamically and things like that. So we get this access log stream from Envoy, which is observability lag. So essentially completing the feedback loop here. And yeah, so if the call gets accepted, it's just forwarded to the service as usual. And then the response goes back and modified back to the original caller. So that's basically the insertion. And the configuration, uh, the way configuration looks like is like we use this CRD called Envoy Filter. Uh, so the Envoy Filter is a construct in Istio configuration, which lets you write these kind of um, interceptor rules that get inserted into the Envoy proxy. So this Envoy filter basically uh, describes a couple of things, the external auth C with the address to the local agent that's running next to the Envoy and also uh, the access logging address. And this Envoy filter can be applied selectively. It doesn't need to be pervasive. So you can do it pervasively. If it's a daemon set, you can do, do it pervasively. Or if you want to do it more surgically, then you can even have a workload selector. So workload selectors in, in Istio let you uh, be more surgical with this insertion. Okay, let's move forward. Let's talk a little bit about Aperture's architecture next. So at the heart of Aperture is a control loop. So the way it works is the Aperture agents, they have an inbuilt open telemetry collector, which lets it gather matrix both locally and from external technologies like databases and such. So that telemetry is written to Prometheus and then um, there is another component called a Aperture Controller, which could either be hosted by you or it could be hosted in our uh, commercial solution called Aperture Cloud. So everything above a Aperture agent is hosted in a Aperture Cloud, or it could all be, if you're using the open source version, it, all, all, it could all be hosted by you. So the job of a Aperture Controller is to run these uh, policy circuits, which are evaluated periodically. So it will periodically uh, request the result of those metrics using PromQL queries and then run a signal processing circuit, which results in some adjustments which are written down into etcd. So etcd is used both for sending these adjust adjustments down to, control, uh, to do aperture agents and also for propagating configuration. So if you install new policies, so the same mechanism is used to populate those policies in a aperture agent. So, so far, so good. So uh, yeah, so aperture control loop is kind of the heart of the system. And let's move forward to maybe more functionality inside the aperture agent. So the first functionality I want to talk about is distributed token buckets. So, so these uh, distributed counters, essentially, we have this distributed hash table. So, it, so aperture agents form a peer-to-peer -peer group uh, between uh, agents belonging to each agent group. So we form, form this kind of peer-to-peer um, -peer network, which is being used for maintaining these distributed counters. So these are used for use cases such as rate limits. You want to limit uh, incoming requests by users, let's say. So there will be a bucket for each user. 
and it's a token bucket. So it's like, um, unlike window counters, this is like um, pretty accurate and um, very smooth. Uh, so the same technology is also used for quota limits. So if you're working with third-party APIs, the same kind of token bucket mechanism. So there's a leader for each token bucket. So there's a lookup on the leader. It could either be a synchronous call or a lazy sync kind of a call. Um, so this is basically how counters work in a butcher. Uh, another technology typically used by some users is Redis. So this is more high performance implementation than Redis. So Redis is a single service which can become a bottleneck. So this is more of a peer-to-peer -peer kind of a architecture, which is more scalable and it's, it dynamically shards the keys. So if an agent goes away, it will dynamically shard the keys. Or if a new agent comes, it will dynamically reshard the keys based on that. So that's the distributed token bucket. So moving on, uh, the next technology I want to talk about in a virtual agent is the scheduler. So just like operating systems have schedulers for processes, you have nice values and such. So we are we have this kind of this network based scheduler, and the algorithm that we have here is called weighted fair queuing scheduler, which is used in packet switching networks and also used here. Uh, so each request essentially gets a priority or a weight. And based on that weight, this algorithm makes sure that uh, the utilization is essentially in, in the ratio of these weights. So, so if you say paid users get a priority of 200, trial users get a priority of 100. So this means there's a one is to two ratio. So paid users get double the priority. So if they're both seeing similar kind of request rates, then on average paid users will see twice the acceptance rate. And this comes into play when you're under overload or when you're close to quota limits. So the scheduling comes into play. And maybe you want to deprioritize something like a background task or maybe free tier users in this case, you want to deprioritize. So it's like 10 times less or 20 times less than paid users. So those will the, those requests will be the first ones to get dropped or the first ones to uh, be at the tail. They'll be at, essentially at the tail of the queue. So requests coming in, uh, getting classified into these different um, categories. And then um, the way they get dequeued is based on this weighted fair king scheduler. And by the way, the, the way requests get dropped is based on the timeout that is configured. So uh, when you do this integration, this um, auth C integration, so you define a timeout value. So this is the amount of time you're willing to queue the request with an aperture. So, so far so good, let's move on. Um, pretty much covered like the core uh, tech pieces in aperture. So let's move on and, and see how Aperture works in practice. Uh, so I'm going to, going to show a demo application uh, where Aperture is running in action. So the test setup that we have, um, so we have a PostgreSQL database and we have a service which is making a request to PostgreSQL whenever there's an incoming request. Um, it's an HTTP service, so whenever there's an HTTP request and it's all glued together through Istio. There's a K6-based K6 is a project which lets you simulate users and traffic and so and such. So uh, K6 is making these requests, making requests to the service and going through Envoy. And the traffic mix that we have is like their guest users and subscribers. Subscribers are high priority and the breakup of traffic is 50-50, like 50% subscribers, 50% guests. And the traffic pattern that we have is like, it's like a sinusoid or, a, or more, more of a uh, a square way where it starts with 10 users for one minute and then it goes to 100 users. So when it, once it goes to 100 users, then this service uh, makes a lot of API calls to PostgreSQL and PostgreSQL queue starts to fill up. So we are monitoring the number of um, um, active connections in PostgreSQL. So if the active connections goes near 100%, then there would be queue build up here and the latencies will spike up for all the users. So you want to make sure that PostgreSQL connection usage stays within bounds. So that's why we are monitoring PostgreSQL using a Aperture agent. So it, it's got an OTEL pipeline, which is scraping matrix, matrix from PostgreSQL, and then using this in an algorithm to do this dynamic throttling of API requests coming into the service. And then also prioritizing traffic. So here is the policy which does all this. So the first part of the policy is defi defining an OTEL pipeline. So it's defining this address of PostgreSQL instance and the collection interval. So this is how we get matrix into um, our system, into the Prometheus database. Uh, the second part of the policy is basically defining criteria, the algorithm uh, for uh, throttling. So a set point of 40 is, is defined. This means if 40% of connections are used in PostgreSQL, we want to start throttling. 
And the throttling policy is very simple. It's a progressive additive increase, additive decrease kind of a policy we have. So we do a 20% decrease in load anytime uh, we detect an overload. And if let's say we are not in overload, like that means less than 40% usage of connections, then we do a 5% increase progressively every 10 seconds. So very simple policy, but it works really well. Uh, because connection usage, um, what happened there? Uh, can you guys see, still see my screen? I'll, I'll just continue. So uh, yeah, this is the policy and um, yeah, so that's the algorithm, 5% decrease every 10 seconds. So down here is selectors which identify requests for scheduling. So it's like uh, like a workload selector. Actually more not just workload selector, it's also looking into traffic labels. Um, so basically identifying the service where we want the scheduler to act. And down here we have defined priorities. So we're saying guest users have 50 priority and subscribers have 250. So let's see how the matrix look like once we have the policy in place. So on the left of the graph, you see before the policy was deployed. So we saw, um, so this is like before aperture. So nearly 100% connection usage when the traffic ramped up. And like after aperture is installed, the overload is prevented and we stop seeing any errors. Like earlier we were seeing too many clients already on the service. So we stopped seeing this error. And also we started getting this prioritization of traffic, which is shown in the graphs here. So um, incoming take token rate is higher than accepted. This means there's some queue buildup happening because of throttling. And we see higher acceptance rate for subscribers versus guest users. And conversely, higher rejected rate for guest users and lower rejected rate for subscribers. So yeah, so this is the priorities in action. So roughly five times acceptance rate for subscribers versus guest users. So this number is almost five times. So this is the weighted fear queuing algorithm in action. So that is it guys. So let's move on to Q and A. So I would encourage you guys to check out the Aperture project on GitHub, even uh, try out the Aperture cloud, uh, which is the commercial solution, which uh, does controller as a managed service and also gives you rich analytics. So I'm open to questions now. All right, so uh, I'm looking at the Q&A section. So there's a question which is uh, from Mitch Connors. He's saying, is it possible to detect overload without dedicate, dedicated matrix like Postgres Q, perhaps using Istio layer seven matrix? Absolutely. Uh, so we uh, do have policies which can actually look at uh, things like latencies. Uh, we haven't used Istio's matrix, but there's nothing stopping us from the, doing that. Like you can write, because uh, Istio matrix are exposed as um, Prometheus compliant matrix, so you can write an OTL pipeline to scrape those matrix. Uh, but you can also uh, use Aperture's built-in flux meter. There's a component called flux meter, which lets you create histograms, which are even more detailed than Istio's layer seven matrix. You can go down into like uh, GraphQL payload and looking at labels inside that to uh, get these layer seven kind of latency matrix, percentile matrix, and so on. So, Okay, that was the only question. I'll check the chat as well. Um, all right. Um, any other questions, anyone? All right, I'll, that's all the slides I had. So um, maybe I can show you guys a little bit more if you guys are interested, like how circuit-based policies look like. So essentially you're designing these signal processing graphs. Um, but by the way, we have made it pretty simple like um, for anyone to use this product. So, we, so you don't really have to design this. So we have these high level uh, blueprints that you can use out of the box. Just fill in like high level YAML and get started. So we have these, um, basically these kind of recipes. 
Uh, so under load scheduling, um, so for instance, someone has, someone was asking, can we do we need specialized matrix like PostgreSQL? So you can even look at things like latencies and use that as a feedback for throttling requests. This is like a quick view of how um, the entire um, stack works uh, from um, classification stage to scheduling. And um, this, this example doesn't show Istio. So essentially, uh, a service could be directly talking to a virtual agent. It could be doing through Istio. It could be doing, doing through Kong. But essentially, the same kind of interface works for all these technologies. And um, so the interesting thing we have done is with this Rego. Uh, so Rego is typically used for authorization use cases, but we use Rego over here for more than that, for flow control, observability, and so on. So the same set of labels can be used both for observability and control. So that's an interesting innovation we did here. And yeah, and um, this is like the architecture of Aperture in open source. So just, just the stuff we talked about. So there's a control circuit running in the controller, which is periodically computed, and the decisions are propagated through etcd. So I'll just go back to the Q and A section if there are more questions for me. Uh, okay, no questions till now. All right. Um, all right. Let I think we can end the session if there are no more questions.